Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Bruce Sabri, and thank you for joining us for our AST, Stay Ahead of the Race for Talent with Oracle Succession Planning. I'd like to uh, show you our quick agenda here, and I'll introduce myself, and then I'll introduce the company. Again, my name is Bruce Sabri. I'm a human resource information professional. I've spent about 14 years at Oracle's uh, running their pre-sales business for North American Human Capital Management. I then was at a French energy exploration company. We were working on e-business suite, HCM version 12. I was there for approximately five years. Our implementation spanned 33 countries, 33 languages, and we implemented employee self-service as well as manager self-service. I'm a subject matter expert in Oracle eBusiness HCM as well as Oracle Cloud HCM. Currently, I'm a regional sales director at AST for the states listed below, and if you happen to be in any of those states, I would love to meet you personally. Let me go ahead and introduce the company. So at uh, AST, Oracle Platinum Partner, our ability to provide Oracle solutions to our clients that we specialize in fixed price bids. In our 19 years, we have never had a failed implementation. We also have a track record of 100% on time, on budget delivery. Now, as you know, Oracle has a huge number of products and services. At AST, we've organized our practices into key solution areas where we feel we can offer the best benefit to our clients. Our ERP practice is centered around the Oracle eBusiness Suite, as well as the Oracle Cloud applications. Our other practices include business intelligence, enterprise performance management and Hyperion, middleware, and for us middleware is primarily identity management, SOA, or service-oriented architecture, as well as web center. We also have a CRM practice, and much like our ER pre-practice, we can offer that to be installed on-premises or in the cloud. ASD has further distinguished ourselves as a partner by being an Oracle pillar partner in SOA, Business Intelligence, and Hyperion. AST holds specialized status in a number of Oracle products, and we are very confident that our Oracle HCM certifications will ensure your future project success. We are especially proud that AST is a multiple Oracle Excellence Award winner, and that we've been named as one of the best workplaces and fastest growing companies in the U.S. Now, let's move ahead and talk about some of the trends that are happening in uh, today's HR business. All right. So we've known that uh, this situation was coming for a long time. I recall back in 2004, there was a Bureau of Labor Statistics study that predicted that there would be a shortage of, back then it was predicted to be about 20 million, but it's actually grown larger since then. Our, our recruiters face an especially difficult challenge, and leadership is clearly concerned about this shortage of talent. Um, I live in Houston, Texas, and uh, that's sort of the energy capital of the world, and a lot of my friends and former colleagues are still in the energy industry, and we see on a daily, almost hourly basis that uh, there is a critical work for talent. There are stories of uh, just how few college graduates there are in very specific areas like petrochemical engineering. And uh, one of my friend's sons was actually hired to go to Saudi Arabia right out of college on an expat contract for about $500,000. So it's, uh, it's pretty remarkable that the, uh, the salary inflation is actually happening because of this war for talent. So an interesting byproduct of this is that in the very near future, we're going to have five generations of workers in the workplace. And just, just think about that for a second. So each generation has different working styles and expectations. Our Generation X employees have you know, very high expectations in terms of income and, and uh, expect flexibility in their work lives. They may um, feel that they want to work from home or at least have the flexibility to do so. And they take a lot of things for granted, technology for one of them. Um, they come to a workplace and they really expect that uh, their employer of choice is going to have the latest and greatest products. So we have a, uh, an opportunity to, to talk about some of those products today. And the thing of the matter is that we're all going to be competing for these new workers. 
they demand these new technologies, and they actually grew up with these technologies. And um, we have an opportunity to uh, really influence the, the rest of the workplace uh, to, to really challenge them and to do a better job um, giving them interesting work to do. And part of that is, you know, really preparing for the future. And uh, we can use technology to do that. Um, we can influence engagement by knowing our talent, um, aligning our, our objectives for our employees to, you know, from strategic objectives right down to tactical objectives. And there are a number of technologies that allow us to do that. Uh, we're going to talk about succession planning today, and that's really a component of talent management. Uh, we're going to talk about that in eBusiness Suite, which is on-premise. And we're also going to talk a little bit about it um, for the cloud, which is yet another enabling technology. But just broadly, what we're looking for is technological solutions that will help us to, one, retain our best and brightest, and two, um, to attract the best and brightest. And we can do that in a number of different ways by incenting our employees for referrals or retention bonuses, et cetera. And um, the other component is simply to have systems in place where we can identify our best and brightest. So that's a combination of those systems and processes. We can't forget that you know it is human resources, and we we don't uh, we can't do human resources without humans involved. And um, we but we want to do that in a in a way that is fact based and uh, gives us more um, quantifiable measurements than than we may have had in the past. So how do we get those insights? Well, we want to. Uh, put the, the tools in the hands of the leaders so that they can uh, find to retain our best employees or to make decisions based on facts. Uh, we can give managers, leaders, as well as employees the tools that they need to increase productivity. Um, there have been studies that show that if employees and managers have access to the relevant information that they need in order to make decisions, then those decisions happen in a more timely basis. And since they're fact-based, they're you know, more than likely going to be the right decisions. Now, think about the investment that your organization makes in developing a worker. Just a, an average worker, what does it actually cost in terms of time and development dollars to turn that person into a manager? Just think about it. I've seen studies that, that actually put that cost at about $600,000. And that may not be on the high end either. I've heard much, much higher figures, especially for more senior type employees. Um, at my previous employer, when I was tasked with uh, doing a global succession planning system, my business case was that if we could, if we could retain one single high-performing uh, employee and actually promote her or him from within, that the system would pay for itself. So it really is an easy justification to make. So we've taken a look at a number of uh, statistics here, and um, you know we do talk about the cloud quite a bit. And um, we're going to be hearing about that more and more. I think it's a trend. It's just not going away. The, the, the market forces that, that are compelling a lot of commercial businesses to accept the cloud are so compelling that I think that our, our public sector clients are really taking a good, long, hard look at this as well. All right. Let me uh, give credit where credit is due. Here are the references for a lot of these uh, statistics. And um, let's just move back into the agenda here and see what's next. And I'm going to begin talking about uh, our succession planning demonstration. But first, I'd like to discuss, you know, really, what is succession planning? Um, I can imagine that uh, it means a, a lot of things to a lot of different organizations. But, but why do we care? Why do we care about succession planning? Well, we care because there's really no greater risk to an organization than a change in leadership. Um, or, or a disruption in business operations. And proactively planning for that, which is inevitable, um, can certainly mitigate the risk of disruption or, or to, to business operations. Um, this risk can be also negative public perceptions. It can be a decrease in shareholder value. Um, and also there, there are other reasons why we need to care about succession planning. And that's the fact that often regulators, boards, and financial analysts they expect organizations to have solid succession plans in place. Um, and, and even though there are those demands and, and those regulations, the fact is that uh, most companies either don't have um, a systemic approach to succession planning. 
let's take a look at the process itself, just generally. So broadly, um, when considering the succession planning process, I mean, how far down the hierarchy does an organization need to go um, in, in order to plan for succession? Uh, um, you know, taking is that key jobs or individuals. Um, sometimes uh, the most the weakest link in the chain in an organization isn't necessarily near the top, but maybe it's a shop foreman or or some other key person. Um, you know, what are those critical roles? It's it's an opportunity to think about those and and uh, what they are in your organization. Um, there are a lot of best practices that that go around this, this process, and um, we'll talk about those best practices. Of, a little bit more in detail later. But what I want to emphasize about this process is that this isn't you know, something that we just do once, once a year or once every other year, but this should really be a living, breathing document, a, a process that is ongoing and really top of mind for HR leaders and for the business as well, because we all know that change is inevitable. All right, so having just sort of done a level set about uh, succession planning and why we care about it, Let's actually start talking about what we're going to see today in our demonstration. So I have an employee. His name is Blair Palmer. He's the VP of HR, and he would like to compare two high-performing employees, a gentleman named Terry Bennett and a gentleman named Frank Black. Blair is going to compare them side by side, and then he's going to add them to a succession plan. It's pretty straightforward. All right, I'm going to move into the software itself. All right, a little bit of screen lag here. Uh, but what I'm going to do here is actually sign in to the application. And once I sign in, the system knows exactly who I am and what rights and responsibilities that I have. So click Enter. What are we looking here? What are we looking at? So typically, uh, when using uh, an Oracle EBS or a cloud solution or any ERP system for that matter, you're often confronted with a portal page. So what is a portal? A portal is a, a page that brings the most commonly used um, actions that, that I do as a part of my job. So it knows that I'm the HR, uh, the HR VP. I have some recruitment functions that I can do along the left-hand side. I've got some talent management. I can take a look at compensation. Um, toward the center there, I've got some interesting job demographics with a drop-down list that I can see people by different criteria. Um, but probably the thing that I use the most is my work list. So I've got it sort of front and center on my screen. And this is the way that the system communicates with me. When I have something to do, workflow is going to send me a notification. And that could come from, from any other part of the HR system, be it uh, HR, talent, succession, uh, goals, you name it. Remember, we're talking about an integrated HCM system here. All right, so from there, I'm just going to take a look at my own organization. All right, so I've got a, uh, you know, a very graphically rich way of looking at my organization. If um, some of you have questions at the end to talk about how we got employee pictures in here, um, I actually at my previous employer, we loaded 12,000 employee pictures into the system, and there are best practices around that too, which um, if you're curious, I'd be more than happy to talk to you about it. Um, so I can easily see my organization, there's me, Blair, at the top, along with my direct reports. And I can drill down um, to, to my subordinates' direct reports as well. But what I want to do is go ahead and take a look at what's called a talent profile. So that center tab there, is going to take me to my talent profile. All right. So what am I looking at? Well, there's a picture of me. That's not really me. That's Blair. Uh, but some basic information about me and a lot of buttons. And these buttons lead to other parts of the HCM system, be that my, my competencies, any qualifications that I have for my particular role, uh, my benefits, what my compensation is, what my base salary is, uh, appraisals, learning, job history, you name it. If, if, uh, if the system is tracking it, it's probably going to be available here on my talent profile. I'm going to go ahead and um, click the expand all, which is just underneath my portrait there. And we'll take a look at what's behind some of these buttons. 
So here are my actual competencies. Now I know that a lot of you aren't using competencies, and, and maybe some of you are. Um, there are ways to uh, to use competencies and in a limited way if you don't want to use them throughout your organization. Um, I love talking about competencies. Um, talent management is a passion of mine. Um, so I hope that there's some good questions at the end. But I've also got some appraisals, some information about my appraisal history. I'll scroll down a little bit. Benefits, any other information that I have. Uh, learning certifications, they're in the center. Um, any learning paths. So we actually can have uh, curricula and courses in the learning management system that, that I can track my progression towards some goal that I have. Um, and then my career path. And, and that's essentially the detail behind all of those buttons. So what I'm going to do now is go back to the top of the page and select one of my employees. If you remember, we were going to talk about Terry Bennett. So all I have to do is to select Terrence Bennett. Just scroll down and find him. All right, and here is his talent profile. This screen should look very familiar. We just looked at it. And um, I can do the exact same things for Terry um, that I just saw for myself. This is all work-related information. There's nothing personal here. Um, and if I want to dig into some of his uh, talent information, I can certainly do that here. But what I'm going to do is on the right-hand side of the screen there, I want to compare his profile. You can see that I've got a list of actions. Um, there are many actions that are, are part of self-service. Um, in this case, I am a manager, but I'm also uh, an HR manager as well as uh, Terry's manager. So I have a lot of things that I can do to update his record. But I'm going to compare his profile. All right. So I've added that, and I'm going to take a look at Frank Black's record. Again, the same information from the same screen. Taking a look at his talent profile, I'm going to scroll to the bottom of the page. And on the bottom, you can see that I've already added Terry. When I hit Select for Comparison, Terry was added. What I'm going to do now is go ahead and on the right-hand side, I'm going to add him to the compare. All right, so that's done. And now you can see that there are two people that there, both Terry and Frank, uh, that I'm going to compare side by side. Now, I'm not limited to two employees. I don't want you to get that impression. I can add as many employees as I want to. Um, and what this will do is once I click uh, the actual compare button here, it's going to generate a report for me. And I'll be able to take a look at these two gentlemen side by side. And here we go. All right, so the system generated a PDF. And I can see right off the bat that um, if I'm looking at this nine box here, um, Terry shows up on the nine box, but Frank doesn't. Um, I can see a little bit toward the bottom of the page that I actually have more information on Terry than I do for Frank. And you know, that's just something that's going to happen in the course of, of uh, the HR business. You're, you're going to have gathered more in information about certain employees than you would have on others. But we know from talking to Frank's manager um, and reports that we've heard back that he's also a high performer and we want to add him to a pool to a succession plan. Let me scroll down so we can see some more of this. All right. So again, I have a lot more information on uh, Terry than I do for Frank, but I can see that they're fairly evenly compensated. Okay, so I have um, quite a bit of information that I can add here. So now I'm going to go and I just hit Alt-Tab and that took me back to the, the screen that was uh, right underneath that uh, PDF report that we were looking at. And right next to the compare Comparison tab, you can see that there's a Succession Planning tab. So right from the Comparison, I can go to Succession Planning. Alright, I'm going to 
the, well, the first thing I want to do is, well, who am I succeeding? Um, I want to take these two gentlemen, uh, Terry and Frank, and put them as potential for successors for somebody uh, that you can see a successor for, Eric So, which is really short for a person named Barry Erickson who is in our system. Let's, let's search for him. All right. So there's Barry Erickson. He's the one I want. I just hit quick select. All right. And we can see that we're in a succession planning page. Once we've selected the two people in the succession plan, we can add additional information relating to the succession. I'm going to talk about some of these columns a little bit. Um, I've got a plan status here. Um, so I've got a, a succession plan for a worker. The worker's name is Barry Erickson. Um, I've got the employee numbers of the two potential successors. I have a succession potential. And those are drop down those boxes. And we're going to talk about those in just a second. Um, what percentage of readiness would they have? Are they 50% ready? Are they 75% ready? Is one of them just 100% ready and he can take over if uh, Barry should decide to retire or, or for some reason leave the organization? Um, what would be the earliest date? What would be the latest succession date? Maybe uh, one of these two gentlemen has told us that uh, he's got a window and then after that he's going to retire or he's made other plans. Um, are they already eligible for a promotion? And then we can stack, stack rank them. All right. I'm going to move on to the plan status. And I've made that active. So they are both on this now active succession plan. Okay. So I said I was going to talk a little bit about um, these drop-down list boxes. So anywhere in Oracle eBusiness Suite HCM, or in Cloud HCM for that matter, anytime you see a drop-down list box, I want you to think that this is something that we can configure to our own needs. So if your organization uses some other language, some other words to describe uh, succession potential, those are the words that we use. Those can be very easily added to a list of values that can be displayed. That doesn't work just here, but it works in any of the HCM modules, be it talent, benefits, HCM, you name it. Where you have a drop down this box, I want you to think configurable. But in addition to that, when you start configurating, you're probably thinking, uh-oh, well, if I configure the system, um, what happens when I upgrade? Well, the good news is that these drop down list boxes and all these configurations are done in such a way that when you upgrade your system from one release to the next, these configurations are preserved. They're not touched in any way, and they will uh, just continue to function release after release. And that's really all there is to uh, creating a succession plan. So I, this is what I did. You know, I, I signed in as an HR user with permission to work on a succession plan. I compared two high-performing employees, and I created a succession plan for them for a key role. And that's all there is to it. I hit save. And then I can go about my business. Um, obviously, there's, it takes a lot of effort to get to this point. There have been meetings. There's been discussions. There's been some um, evaluations between Terry and Frank. And this is really the end result of a process. And all we're really doing here is recording a process. So let's talk about deployment options. All right, so there's deployment options with Oracle. All right, well, there's the one that we just took a look at, which is the eBusiness Suite. Um, you actually own the software. You own the computers that are, um, the software is on. Um, they're inside your, your building. Uh, you've got people to maintain them. You've got developers and DBAs, and um, pretty much your organization is running the show. You own the applications. The second model is uh, the cloud. So essentially, you're subscribing to the applications. So all of that stuff, the servers, the, the, the database on the back end, all the applications technology is hidden from you. And you're using just your, your browser-based computer to access your applications in a very secure way. The important thing is that you still own the data. Uh, it's just the applications that you're, you have a subscription to. And if you ever get a chance, I would uh, recommend uh, taking a tour of the uh, data center in Austin if you're contemplating the cloud. 
It's in Austin, Texas. It's a really a remarkable, a remarkable facility. I really like the part where they do, they do a retinal scan and then you're sort of in this cage. It's, it's very James Bond. I think that you'd enjoy the experience. Um, th there's actually a third option, which is coexistence. So let's say that you really, really like your poor HR and payroll, but you do want to do a little something in, you know, in the cloud, be that talent or succession planning or goals or performance. Oracle offers this coexistence model where you can keep your HR and your payroll inside your four walls running on your computers, but then it connects the talent portion to the Oracle Cloud and it keeps it all in sync. And that's a low risk way for um, the, the, a lot of clients choose to uh, make their first entry into the cloud. All right, so why is everybody talking about this cloud in the first place? Why am I even bringing this up? Well, it, it's it's because uh, uh, the, the, main, the main reason is, is cost. There's just no way around it. It's just a lot, a lot less expensive to run something on the cloud. It's the bottom line. It's simply less expensive. It uh, allows us to take those developers and those DBAs uh, that would normally be working on our on-premise system, and we can redeploy them. We can either redeploy them to, to do something that's uh, you know, a, a competitive differ differentiator for our own organization, or we can move them to maybe a more strategic project. And um, so they go from supporting an internal system to maybe something that can increase uh, revenue in some way. All right. And um, before we take a look at the cloud-based software, I just kind of like to take a brief moment and say, a few words about how Oracle actually developed it. Well, they took a lot of best practices um, from their existing products, which was obviously the Oracle eBusiness Suite. You know that Oracle has owned PeopleSoft for a few years now, as well as JD Edwards. But primarily, I think that what Oracle did was take a lot of input from its clients, some very large global clients, some public sector clients, some clients with very unique needs, and just took all of that input and um, really synthesized everything together to, to create a new experience in the cloud. All right. So let's take a look at what succession planning actually looks like in the HCM cloud. All right, so I'm going to log in here. I'm just going to do it quick and dirty here. Just log in. Okay. So same, same sort of metaphor. I'm, I'm taken to a landing page, or again, a portal, and I have logged in here as a uh, person named Linda Swift. And if any of you have used the Yahoo portal um, or, or you know, Google, you, you know how you can arrange your, uh, the way that your page looks and feels? You can do the exact same thing here. So as Linda, I've decided that the first thing I want to see is my employee handbook because I'm referring to it all the time. Maybe my phone rings off the hook about policy questions at my organization. Well, with this portal, we can link directly to our manual. I also care about headcount by business unit. I get calls all the time about that. Um, these bars, I can actually click on the bars and they'll take me to the source data. And again, my notifications are there. This is where I get my workflow notifications, just the same way that you're used to seeing in eBusiness Suite. The, uh, the workflows work exactly the same way in the cloud. And then I've got some nice buttons here that will take me directly to different parts of the system. All right, so from there, I'm going to go to my org chart like I did in the previous demonstration. And what am I looking at here? Well, obviously an org chart. But um, for those of you with keen eyesight, you can see that this one might be a little bit different. So uh, let's take a look at Robert Jones. He's the head of HR for this particular organization. And I see his name and his title. And then I see a little button with a drop-down arrow that says Actions. In the cloud, Oracle has this thing that it calls an actionable org chart. And they wanted to understand, or Oracle did understand, that people work in different ways. Some people work visually. Some people work by navigating menus. So Oracle gives you the option. I can either use the icons in that blue bar across the top. You can see there's a little house there. Obviously, that's going to take me home. 
there's a compass that takes me to my navigator, which will take me to a list of all the screens that are available to me. I've got some favorites. I've got a little flag there that will take me directly to my workflow notifications. But for today's purpose, what I want to do is click on that actionable org chart and look at succession. So I'm going to click that. All right. So I've clicked succession planning directly from the organization that I'm planning for. And what that means is, so at the Robert Jones level, I clicked on succession plan. So what it's going to actually do is automatically create a succession plan for that person, for Robert. So I'm going to click again. In this case, it's automatically going to create a succession plan for this VP of HR. All right. And here's what that looks like in the Oracle Cloud. All right. Let's take a look at the tabs across the top. So there's my succession plan. In this case, I just have one of them, but I can have multiple plans for the same individual. Um, I've got an organization chart where I was, and then I've got a talent pool tab. Just below that, you, you, you can see the, the familiar icons for to create something new, to edit something existing, and then to disable something. And I can always export to Excel, and then I see there's a little filter there next to a spreadsheet. I can filter results if I have a, a large amount of data that I want to sift through. Personally, I'm colorblind, so this doesn't mean a whole lot to me. But um, I could see at the center of that pie is the actual succession plan. It's for a vice president. And then that second concentric circle tells me their readiness. And then that third circle tells me who is the actual person. Right. I am going to go ahead and drill into these these six potential successors. All right. So just like we saw uh, previously in the EBS, I have where well, we were looking at Frank and Terry before. Now we're just looking at a larger list, and I am essentially doing the same thing. You can see that this uses different drop-down list boxes that have different values. And I can easily success, I'm sorry, select succession candidates and input various uh, criteria. If I'm using the Talent Cloud, the, the system may already contain enough information about those employees to find a best fit. You can see that there's a button there that's kind of highlighted um, across the top. It says Find Best Fit. Um, in this way, if, if we allow the system to do the work for us, since it obviously captures a lot of information about our employees, their length of service. Um, if we're using talent management, it knows what my, my performance reviews are. Have I attained my goals? Um, if I'm using competencies, at what level have I attained in my competencies? The system already knows all of this. So why don't we let the system find us some additional candidates? But first, it wants, I'm going to go ahead and click on that. The first thing that it wants to do is, well, which criterion do you want to use? So um, I've got different things that I can use. Uh, in this case, uh, competencies are highlighted, but there's some other things here like work requirements. Suppose uh, you know, I need to be able to uh, speak Spanish, or um, I need to have an advanced degree, or I need to be a membership. All of those different criteria are listed. Um, I can list them by priority. So let's say that competencies are, are very important. And then by clicking on the details button, I can assign, I'm sorry, I'm going to click on priority next just so you can see what that drop down this box looks like. All right, so I can assign um, a, a weighting to that particular uh, criterion. Again, a drop down list box, quick quiz, what does that mean? It means that I can configure that to reflect the language of my organization. So now I'm going to click on the details button just kind of right next to that. And I want to see the details behind competencies. All right, so these are the actual competencies that this particular job was set up with. And not coincidentally, we're also tracking these very same competencies against individuals. So when I say find the best fit, if the uh, job that I'm looking for requires leadership, 
uh, you know, that we are required to have leadership at a very high level, and that I'm an employee sitting out there that's not been found before, by waiting this and clicking on this match for, for leadership competency, I can actually find more candidates than maybe I was aware of. Okay, so I'm going to click OK here. All right, now I'm going to select members, and I can see that this is really a process. If you would, look across the top there. Um, I've entered some details, and now I'm going to select members, and I can add additional criteria. So I've given this uh, uh, talent pool, if you will, of, of potential leaders. This plan status is active. Who owns this plan? Um, that's another best practice that we'll get to. But I can slice and dice my results. Maybe I want only people from a particular job, or a particular grade, or job family, or a business unit, or a department to be part of this query. So you can see that it's pretty easy to, to create these talent pools using a sort of step-by-step -step train track metaphor across the top. All right, I'm going to go ahead and let the system find all those people for me. Okay, so these are the people that came back. Now, in this particular cloud HCM implementation that I'm using, this is a global system. So you're seeing people that come from, from different departments. Like you'll see like a Compensation UK, um, Help Desk US. So people are coming from all over the world. Um, I didn't put any restrictions on how I wanted that search to be executed. So it's, it's pretty neat that um, you know, if I'm just in the US, I tend to think about just my US employees. Or if I'm in a police department, all I really think about is my police department employees. But there may be other employees in different departments that I will have the authority to view, maybe, maybe not. And um, those results will come back in my query. And once I've selected the employees that I want, I can manage their development goals. So what did I just say? So that's kind of interesting. I found some people that met a criteria, and I want to further develop them. They're part of a talent pool. Maybe all of the people that I just chose, maybe they're people that I want to develop as future managers or future leaders in the organization. So I can add development goals for them. So that can be anything from what you see here um, to increase shareholder value and effective time management. But it could also be something as simple as a class that I had to take when I was a new manager at Oracle. It was called Manager 101. You know, how to just essentially the basic skills that one needs to learn how to manage people. Um, so I can assign any kind of goal that I want to. That goal can be uh, attained by either providing uh, classroom training or attending a course, which might be in our learning system, or it, it might be some exterior training that I need to talk about. All right, and that, that's really how we uh, create a talent pool for a succession plan. So we talked about two individuals in the first part of the demonstration, Terry and Frank, who are going to replace Barry. We had two people replacing a single role. In this case, it was Barry Erickson. In the cloud version of this, I had a VP of HR position where I created a talent pool. And then I just save and close, and that's pretty much all there is to it. But remember when we were talking about the millennials and the Gen Xers? Well, here's a cool part of um, the cloud experience is that um, you are able to access the parts of the system that are most frequently used, either as a manager or an employee. And you're able to actually do your transactions on an iPad or on a phone or an Android. Um, you name it, it's device independent. And that is uh, just one of the things that I think our millennials and Gen Xers and even the, the new uh, generation that will be coming up in the next few years, this is what they expect. And I, I just don't think there's any way to temper their expectations. I mean, this is, this is, um, this is what's out there and this is what our new employees are going to demand when they're making decisions in, frankly, um, a candidate's market about where they want to work. All right, so um, if there's any questions about the demonstration, please write them down, and I'll be more than happy to try to answer them at the end. But let's talk about best practices as well. So I'm not actually going to read all of these, 
So let's take a look at them, and I'll just make some comments on some of them while you're reading them. You know. All right, so one of the key, key uh, best practices is to simply have some either formal or informal process. Obviously, if you're thinking about succession planning, that's a really good start, be it either on spreadsheets or, or, or on some kind of system, be it homegrown or, or, or just something that someone developed. Or Any process is better than no process. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, one uh, statistic is the one inform individuals that they are identified as successors. To me, that was really fascinating. And there was a paper um, that the Corporate Leadership Council did. And if you'll just note this, that 63% of organizations do not tell their employees that they're part of a succession plan. So most companies don't even tell people that they're part of a succession plan. But if you tell that person, they're 38% more likely to stay at your organization. So to me, that's just huge. And um, that kind of goes back to culture, which is in the next column. Um, if, you, if an employee has an expectation of having a future within the organization, they're more likely to stay. And then a, a lot of those cultures have to do, those cultural items, best practices, have to do with incentives. So. You know, there, there are different ways to do incentives. A lot of organizations don't have a lot of spare cash to throw around to, uh, to people, but we can reward and recognize those managers who promote, recognize, and praise. Um, when we talk about the identification of successors, um, obviously the, a, a huge way to get some traction here is to simply to use a, a competency management system. If you know the competencies that you're looking for and you're tracking those and uh, employees are measured against goals, well then that really makes the whole process of succession planning easier. But um, you know, just because we, we have competencies doesn't mean that they're necessarily going to be the competencies that we need tomorrow. Um, one of the companies that I worked with in Houston, a very, very large employer, I'm talking over 100,000 employees, uh, they had a fleet of vehicles. Um, they, the business decided that they could save uh, about $100 million by purchasing a fleet of liquid propane gas vehicles and, and slowly phase out the diesel vehicles. So they went ahead and did that, purchasing, purchased the vehicles, and the drivers drove the vehicles. Um, unfortunately, there wasn't any kind of uh, strategic workforce planning that happened. And when it was time to service the LPG trucks, no one had the skills to actually repair the trucks. So that was a clear case of a misalignment between competencies and future organizational requirements. So I, I think that if we're thinking about the future and HR is engaged with the businesses in a proactive way, that we can avoid some of those, you know, sort of egg on, on my face moments. This also implies that, you know, on the right-hand side, that we're, we're actively engaging with these potential successors, that they're being mentored, that they feel like they have a, uh, a place for the, for the company in the future. So if you have any questions about the uh, about these best practices. I've experienced some of these firsthand. Others, I've got sort of, you know, apocryphal uh, tales that I can tell about uh, pitfalls to avoid and, and some things that you definitely do want to do. But that really ties it up for the, the demonstration portion and the best practices piece. And if you want to, you know, certainly take a uh, screenshot of this one if you want. But I'm ready to take some questions now. If, uh, if And the first question that I have here is, uh, is security set up so that you only have access to employees that report to you? Um, that really is a setup question. And the answer is yes, if you set it up that way. Um, it may be that I'm a manager, but I have no access to a succession plan. And that kind of goes back to best practices. Um, how far down the organization do we actually want to create succession plans for? I mean, I may not need a, a succession plan for administrative assistance, 
that I would for say a CFO. Um, so the, the, the manager of the uh, administrative assistance probably wouldn't even have access to the succession planning system at all. So, but um, an HR professional or maybe the head of a, of a department would. So it's really, the answer is it depends. And that's part of the value that AST brings is to actually come in to analyze your requirements and to implement this in the way that works specifically for your enterprise. All right, just uh, not all at once, everybody. Not all at once. Let's see, give you a moment. Okay, here's a question. Um, let's see. We are not using competencies. Can we still use succession planning? Well, that's not atypical. Um, a lot of organizations, they buy these systems, but they, they implement the core piece, and they never get around to um, implementing the competencies. But, but yes, uh, you can use succession planning without competencies. Um, but you don't have to implement competencies you know, full blown. A, you can do this without any competencies at all. But um, probably a, a better answer would be just to do a limited set of basic behavioral competencies like leadership, teamwork, et cetera, and um, use those just for the succession planning. And, and that way, you don't have to be bothered with them. Um, I say that glibly, but um, you won't have to implement those throughout the rest of your organization. I hope that answers the question. If not, then you know, feel free to reach out to me and, and I'll go into greater detail. Um, we have a, another question here. Uh, let's see here. Currently, we are using succession. Uh, we're, we're doing succession planning manually. How difficult is it to implement this solution? That's a good question. And um, again, the answer is it, depending on your requirements. If you have uh, very basic requirements, then it's a pretty straightforward process to implement. Um, if you're using on-premise, it would mean that you you would need to license the module from Oracle, and we would go through the setup process and you know create those lists of values for you, et cetera, et cetera, to, to get that working. Once those pieces are in place, the succession plans, the, the best practices that you saw, they're actually Oracle uses a template-driven approach. So once you have the options turned on that you want, you can use those template filters to, to either turn off or turn on those uh, widgets and bells and whistles that you want, actually want to use in your organization. The answer is it really depends on your organization. If you have some customizations that you might want, that would obviously make it a little bit, um, you know, little bit more effort involved in implementing. Um, in general, I think it's probably um, uh, uh, easier to implement the cloud solution um, just because of the way that that is um, it's just easier set up and that goes back to the compelling reasons for the cloud in the first place is it's just less expensive. Um, I don't have another question so we'll just uh, hold on here for a second and see if we get another one. Okay. Um, I've got one. You talked about succession planning being a living, breathing process. How have you seen organizations keep this process up successfully? Um, that is a good question. And I think that, that that really has less to do with, um, it's a cultural thing, I think. And it, it really comes from leadership from the top. This kind of goes back to that team-based approach in that culture portion of this, the best practices that we really want to have a multidisciplinary approach to succession planning. Um, we, you really want to get not just maybe you or your manager to decide who's going to succeed, but um, and I don't have the, the benefit of knowing what your specific role is, but maybe you know someone from finance should be involved, or you know somebody who could potentially be more objective. Um, but the best practice is that we usually find more successful candidates by um, by having more people in the mix that have a stake in the success of the replacement person. But um, you know, it's always one of those situations. If you're 
you know, I, I have to do what my boss says, even though um, sometimes I think that may not be the best thing. It's uh, you know, one of those situations where I guess when I'm the boss, <laughs> maybe I can make those decisions. But um, that's clearly an opportunity to have uh, either a challenging conversation about uh, the pros and cons of the candidate that you would like to put forward versus uh, you know, maybe bringing a fresh perspective from the outside. Um, the interesting thing is that in terms of the system, the system doesn't care. We can bring in a person who's not an employer and add them as sort of a person of interest and add them to a succession plan. All right, let's see if there's any other questions. Okay, I've got one more. Um, in the best practices, it said that it was best to identify a successor for a specific position rather than using talent pools. Um, can, can you elaborate? Um, sure. Um, let me think about that for a second. So, yes, that is a best practice. And if I sort of deconstruct that, I, I think that what they're really talking about there is, um, is talent management um, and, and competencies in particular. So if I have a key role that I'm planning a successor, uh, you know, to, to do a succession plan for a key role, then there are probably some very, very specific competencies that the, 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 the successful person in that role must have. So let's say that you're looking at a, uh, uh, a successor for uh, an executive vice president of, um, of sales and marketing. So that person would have to have you know, obviously outstanding interpersonal skills, outstanding communication skills. Um, maybe they wouldn't need to be so strong in, in some other area. It's, it's really a, a mix of different skills and abilities. Um, when we're talking about a role like that, it probably makes sense to find individual successors who match that talent profile, which is what we looked at before when we were looking at the talent profile pages. Whereas if I'm looking at a talent pool, it, it's really a, it's just that. It's a generic pool from which I can draw for, for generic talent. If it's you know, like a manager or something like that, maybe I wouldn't need to be as exquisitely laser focused in terms of you know, getting it 100% correct. Um, that there's a, there's a little more tolerance for working with the successor. Um, and making sure that it's a right fit rather than you know somebody like an executive vice president in a highly visible position that um, you know any failure would be immediately recognizable. Um, I hope I hope that answers the question. And I don't have any more questions. Um, going once, going twice. All right then. Well, I want to. Uh, Thank you all so very much for attending our, our web conference on succession planning. You can see there is contact information uh, for, uh, for us here at AST. And um, if you're in one of those states that, that um, I work in, I, I'd love to hear from you. I'm very passionate about HR and, and talent management in particular. And um, I'd love to have the opportunity to work with you. So thank you so very much for attending our conference. Good day.